Today on Rambling About Cars, we're not rambling about cars, it's trucks. And in fact, we're going to revisit maybe, maybe possibly a Ford F-150 Lightning coming back. That's shockingly exciting. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the older Lightnings. We're going to talk about some other cool, crazy concept trucks. It's just the truck episode. So ladies and gentlemen, truck titans around the world, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way is Chris Bruce. What's up, Bruce? Not much. Happy to be here. And tonight we have got uh, MotorOne.com senior editor Brett Evans with us. And he he likes trucks. He likes other types of stuff. But we're like we said, we're going to be talking trucks tonight. Um, Starting out with that, we're going to be talking about a rumor that we heard uh, about Ford reviving the Lightning name. Um, Mm you know, that there could be a new Ford Lightning and it's not necessarily going to be a, you know, supercharged F-150 pickup with kind of a street speed uh, kind of styling going on to go with the Raptor. Instead, they're going to use the Lightning name on the electric version of the F-150, allegedly, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, well, I mean, uh, how long have we been talking about it, Bruce? If you're going to have an EV <laughs> pickup truck, it's sort of a no brainer to call it lightning. I mean, it's just a rumor at this point. Right. I would like to think that Ford has been listening to rambling about cars and saying, gosh, those Chris's kind of know what they're talking about. Maybe we should <laughs> call this the the uh, the lightning since there's all kinds of electricity running through it. Uh, of course, Brett Evans, I mean, I mean, Brett's uh, our our big truck guy. Um, and Bruce, you you wrote the article about uh, the rumor. The rumor, yeah. Um, I, I mean, what can you guys tell our listeners here about what this potential lightning might be? Because, like you said, it's not going to be an SVT vehicle, from what we no. understand. But it, it's still going to. I mean, Ford's been saying their electric F one fifty is going to be their most powerful ever. So, you know, what are we looking at? Well, I think it's definitely going to be a pretty impressive machine performance wise. Um, you know, we just, we know that, like you said, they've, they've promised that it's going to be incredibly capable and do everything that an F-150 is able to do. A few years ago when they were working on the prototype, they showed it towing uh, a 1 million pound line <laughs> of train cars, you know, and, and it got them, got them up going, you know, five or six miles an hour, but that's still pretty dang impressive, a million pounds worth on just EV power. So I don't know. I'm really curious to see how they're going to live up to. It's a very legendary, important name in Ford's history. I'm curious to see how they're going to live up to it. And so, from what we have seen, spy shots of this vehicle under development, or you know, you know, we kind of we have an inkling of what to expect. We don't know for sure. One of the interesting things about it is that so the image for our uh, uh, non YouTube watchers right now. They're adding kind of a beefy frame underneath, or at least they have for the uh, development vehicles we've been looking at. We suspect that's probably for kind of supporting all the batteries Mm -hmm. that we know must be underneath this truck. But um, yeah, if you're not watching on YouTube, you can see there that that frame is a lot bigger than we would usually expect to see under an F-150. Like they're really, they're throwing some metal underneath this thing. Well, and and I mean, we know it's it's an electric vehicle. We know it's yeah. going to be heavy. I mean, the modern trucks are already heavy. How heavy is the is the new F one fifty EV going to be? And like you said, is that just for development purposes? Is yeah, that we don't know yet. Some some extra protection under there. I, I mean, I'll say this: when you look at the spy photos, that that frame is like abnormally prominent. I have to believe that that's not a, a final form that we're seeing some sort of, of development item that's that's in place here. Yeah, they um, could very well just be trying really hard to protect those batteries and stuff because those are very expensive components. Or m- maybe that's what's necessary to build a truck like this. We, you know, we kind of don't know. Um, again, for our non-YouTube folks, the image we have up now is of the rear end, which is kind of the best look we've gotten so far. And... Uh, we we're talking about beefy batteries. This thing also has a really big electric motor, or at least a really big electric motor housing. Um, and we can see the half shafts coming off of it. Um, you know, we definitely know rear wheel drive is going to happen. We're almost a hundred percent certain all wheel drive is going to be available. We don't really know. Maybe it's going to have one motor up front. Maybe it's going to have two motors up front, but 
there's no way in hell Ford's only going to offer this with rear wheel drive. And, and really what's interesting here is we look at this photo, um, we're looking at an independent rear suspension here mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. and, uh, and that's pretty spiffy for, you know, all kinds of reasons. Um, but I mean, if you're running a big electric motor on the, well, I, I mean, I guess you could still have a solid axle setup if you're just running a big motor in the back. Right. But, uh, but Ford seems to be going independent here on the, uh, on the back axle. What do you guys, yeah, I mean, I what you- do you guys think about that? How do you feel about that? I, I, uh, cause my I mean, expectation. Tr- I mean, trucks, trucks are generally, I mean, the solid axle is, is better for, you know, all kinds of heavier duty purposes. So, I've been kind of intrigued by by this move. I think the only reason you really see a solid axle is because it can really transmit huge amounts of torque while under load without braking. You know, it's like a much more robust way to transfer 520 pound feet of torque to the rear axle while also towing 10,000 pounds or what have you. Um, and I don't think you have that issue quite as much with electric motors. I think you have a little bit more flexibility power wise to split power right and left without necessarily putting components in danger like you would with a traditional independent rear suspension with half shafts coming off the side. Um, I think that's probably, they've kind of freed themselves a little bit from some of those internal combustion constraints, which I think might might be one reason why you're seeing independent rear suspension instead of a solid axle being driven off of an electric motor PTU or something like that. Yeah, Brett, you literally just kind of took the words out of my mouth that, that, That's exactly the point I wanted to make is that I think as you adopt an EV powertrain, it makes less sense to have a solid rear axle that there's just kind of there are less advantages to that setup when you have a motor back there providing the power. And yeah, you said it better. But I (laughs) I guess I guess my question would be, how are the traditional truck people going to take to that, though? Because, I mean, Brett, you you know this. The traditional truck people aren't going to buy an F one hundred and fifty EV. This is a this is a yeah. first adopter truck vehicle. This is a. I, I don't know though. They, I mean, I think Ford's been doing a pretty good job of. I mean, especially with some of the spy shots, and you'll never convince me in a million years that a lot of these spy shots are. Oh gosh, you caught us! I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, this is free publicity for them, and and of course with the lead up, like with you know the pulling the train cars. I think Ford has been doing a pretty good job of billing this not as something that completely changes the truck segment. It's just, hey, it's it's the best selling truck just with an electric powertrain. I think they're I, I mean, I think they're still banking really hard on traditional truck buyers going for this. I, I'm going to try and catch you a tiny little bit here, Smith, because um I think someone could probably have made a similar argument about the Mustang Mach-E two years ago. And we know how Mustang Faithful took to that vehicle. To that, you know, to your point, this does have a F-150 design and very traditional truck three box shape and everything like that. But I don't think calling it an F-150 is really going to make truck people be like, all right, cool, I can trust this. Any more than calling the Mustang Mach-E meant that traditional pony car people could trust this that version of electric power. So I, I, I kind of think that this one is going to appeal to early adopters and maybe Ford faithful early adopters and a small segment of current F-150 owners who are, who are open to the idea of an EV powertrain. Um, I, I kind of think it's baby steps towards a full EV lineup though. I don't think this is really going to be their big splash. I mean, uh, I see what you're saying with the Maki comparison, but I think that would be more accurate if we were looking at spy photos of the Ford Maverick. And saying, "Oh, that's sure. the new F. That's the new F one fifty. No, yeah. n- nobody would take that. But I mean, when we look at these spy photos, I mean, it's big, it's beefy, it looks like an F one fifty. It's just going to have electric power. I don't know. I mean, you, you raise some interesting points, and obviously, this is going to be this is going to be Ford's first real kind of foray into into that segment. So, yeah. Um, I mean, what do we know?" What else do we know about the uh, the EVF 150 here that that we haven't really discussed? Because just to kind of jump back to this whole lightning rumor, um, Ford hasn't been shy about saying this is going to be their most powerful F-150 ever. So, I mean, does that also kind of tie into what we were just talking about, Brett, maybe with, oh, with yeah. trying to trying to connect with a 
with, with the truck buyers? Yeah, totally. I mean, the the current most powerful F-150 is an EcoBoost, what's it called? The uh, PowerBoost Hybrid V6, which is which is, I mean, I can't remember the exact number of something like, like almost 600 pound feet of torque or something like that. Like it's a staggering amount of power for a half ton truck. So, um, you know, and, and that to that vehicle's credit, it's gone very well with traditional F-150 customers. It's an expensive option for sure, but like everyone who, who has one loves it and they're grateful for both the power that it provides, the, that good trucky low end torque and then also just being an efficient hybridized version of the truck they already love. So, you know, to, to your point earlier, that could actually do very well for Ford with the F-150, the alleged F-150 Lightning. Um, you know, it might be, might be really, they might be able to come out and say, hey, this thing has 750 pound feet of torque for you to tow your 15,000 pound boat. You know, they might be able to really make a splash with that um, and attract EV customers in a way that no current electric vehicle can do so that would be pretty impressive um i don't i don't know i I'm, I'm excited to see it though i'm definitely definitely very curious how they're gonna kind of take this very traditional pickup and and long long-standing history and convert it to an electric vehicle it's going to be a interesting transition for sure well i mean if if the rumor is accurate i mean lightning that's not just a powerful kind of classic classic yeah. pickup truck that's that's always been an on-road high performance street truck so uh, i mean it it uh, it has me spinning in in several different directions here as to what what it could mean if it even if it even happens at all yeah so uh, a couple of things first off going back on what you said what do we know about this truck so the image we're looking at now for uh, on the video portion is the teaser that ford put out and that shows kind of a pretty heavily altered f-150 front end it's familiar but it's got this massive led kind of bracket i guess i would call it on the front end that goes across the hood line and then down through the headlights so I think it's pretty safe to expect that in terms of styling. Um, also, what we think we know, um, the rumor is that the batteries are going to provide 300 miles ish of range for the standard version. And there might be an upgraded battery with 400 miles of range. And so as I think about that, my guess is that is unladen. You know, that's not towing anything. Right. That's not yeah. having payload. So let's say, you know, you're towing that massive boat or RV or whatever. Let's say it cuts that in half. Even 200 miles is that's going to be enough for a lot of people especially once you factor in whatever charging system, which we know literally nothing about that yet, but you know, that it's going to be, it, it seems like Ford is trying to provide pro, uh, impressive specs for this vehicle. Um, at least to me. Um, and then, sorry, just building on your lightning thing. It also seems to me that it's more lightning in connotation, that kind of idea of power and electricity, rather than playing on the idea of the lightnings of the past, which yeah. I know we're going to talk about here in just a moment, that kind of, you know, the past Ford lightnings have been something very different, and this is going to be something new. Yeah, yeah but... But sorry, Brett, Brett, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I definitely don't think if you, if you look at this teaser photo that we've got up on the, on the screen right now, you can definitely see some, uh, some protrusions down low that, that look like front tires. And mm -hmm. you could definitely tell that this is not going to be a low riding, you know, sport truck like lightnings of old. This is, this is going to be a totally new way of thinking about Ford lightning, which might be kind of a tough pill to swallow for some, or it might be just exactly what they want. You know, it might be perfect. Oh, and and that's kind of what I was going to touch on too. I mean, whether Ford likes it or not, if they do come out with an F-150 and they call it lightning, everybody knows F-150 lightning has a low slung high performance street truck. So um, I think it's neat to have the connection with, okay, lightning, um, with it being an electric truck, electric vehicle. But if Ford isn't going to at least offer some sort of on-road performance kind of machine, 
I almost wonder if they're going to have an even tougher battle if they go with the lightning name, just because you already have that association from the previous two generations that at this point have really kind of become their own, their own legend, especially the second gen. Yeah. But the thing is, so I just had to actually look up the year. So the last gen of the lightning, I believe was available in either Oh three or Oh four. So you're talking about uh, Oh four. Sorry. Um, what is it? Fifth over 15 years now that it's been kind of a force on the market. So th- there's definitely going to be those purists that it might be something different, but after that long of a time period without having that nameplate on the road, I think people, in my personal opinion, I think people are going to be willing to accept that kind of change, especially if it still has the performance that we're expecting. If you look at, you know, the GMC Hummer EV, the pickup that they have, they're promising, you know, very, very rapid acceleration. Oh, yeah. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Lightning electric F-150, whatever we want to call it, can't do that as well. Well, I mean, I, mean, I don't think straight line performance is going to be an issue. Um mm-hmm. And maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself because we're going to talk about the classics later. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, Ford also, I mean, SVT back in the day, they baked in well th- as best they could. They tried to bake in some decent handling for a truck. So that's true. Um, I mean, a, a big full size battery electric truck. Uh, I don't I, I mean, I don't really see that being much of a handling machine but i but i don't know i mean these are these are questions that i think people are going to ask and i think it's great that we're talking about it right now because whether it's a specific electric f-150 that's called lightning or they just call the whole thing lightning or if it's not even in the cards there at all i mean ford's certainly raising some eyebrows right now. we're certainly talking about it now that's kind of an interesting interesting idea that maybe the, it will just be, be the F150 EV and then there will be the Lightning variant to kind of go along with the gas F150's Raptor variant. That's kind of an interesting idea. I would I would love to see because I really like the original Lightnings. I think they're they're fantastic and you can't get anything like that on the market anymore. They don't make a lowered sporty in any segment. They don't make a lowered sporty good handling truck since I think like the the Tacoma um, X runner of like 2010 or something like that. Oh, I'm, and I'm that would be really cool to see. That. I mean, that'd be really cool to see Ford be like, okay, you know what? If you want to go really fast off road, you can either get the Raptor or you can get like the F-150 EV FX4 or something like that. But mm-hmm. if you want to go fast in a straight line or around a corner, go for the F-150 EV Lightning. Like that would be... That would be my absolute dream is if they really decided to lean into this lightning mythos in an electric vehicle by making it an on-road handling machine. That'd be really cool. It would. Um, and also, I mean, for shouting out that Toyota, I I haven't I haven't talked about that truck in probably, I don't know, seven or eight years. It's like I totally forgot it existed. That was such a cool little truck. Um, but we're, talk- we're talking lightning here, though. Um, I mean... It's like I said, I'm, I'm torn. Obviously I have a, I have a, a history with Ford. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's really a purist issue if they're, if they bring back the lightning name and it's not on a dedicated, you know, high performance street truck. But I think, I think it, it will be a missed opportunity if Ford doesn't try to at least play that with a version of the truck. I mean, Particularly since nothing exists, it'd be competing in a market right. one. And and admittedly, back in the day, the on-road performance trucks never did that great. Um, and then here comes the Raptor, which is the high-performance off-road truck, and that thing just goes gangbusters, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, if you're looking at it from a bean counter standpoint, it might not make much sense. But if if you're already looking at an electric F one fifty has probably a fairly low volume seller. And when it first launches, I mean, it's it's probably not going to be raking in the sales uh, like you see regular F-150s do. No. M- maybe it's an, maybe it's an opportunity for Ford to say, well, hey, let's let's try this a little bit of an angle. We'll see where it takes us. I mean, Ford has experience doing extremely low volume Halo products. The, the, the you know, reborn Ford GT and then the 
most recent Ford GT. They're extremely expensive to develop. They don't really sell in huge numbers and they cost a fair amount of money. And I think they could probably do the same in the electric truck space and really kind of build maybe a hundred or $120,000 high performance, lowered sporty four door reborn lightning sport truck. I'd, I'd love to see that. I think they should do it. <laughs> I, th- I think it'd be cool. I think, uh, uh, if they could do that and come in under the cost of say a TRX, I know we're comparing, you know, high, we're talking about high performance on road with high performance off road, but if they could do something like that and come in under TRX, that's props to Ford, man. I, that would be some, <laughs> bi- that'd be some major bragging points just, just by itself. Way, way better bragging points than pulling a million pounds of train cars, which we're, we're, we're looking at that image right now on, um, you know, if you're on YouTube, that, so, that was that was kind of gimmicky. I mean, oh, it was totally gimmicky. It it definitely was. Um, I think that there's a point that's worth making though that no electric pickup trucks on the market really exist right now. Where right, you can't buy a Cybertruck yet. You can't buy a Rivian yet. There's Rivian's this is this, close. No, Rivian's and really so Cybertruck and so's Ford yeah. and so's no, GMC Rivian, Hummer Rivian, EV. Like, is isn't Rivian still on track to have something going next I, month in June? I, yeah, oh, by the end next, of it, that soon. I think yeah, so. I, yeah, I know I think, it's yeah, by the Rivian's, end of the year. I, yeah, about I mean, to make by the end of the year, but okay. I, but the point still stands point is that right. none of these are you can walk into a showroom and buy yet. And we are we are on this cusp of this world where there are a ton of electric pickup trucks. And it's kind of fascinating to see, you know, Ford is very much the old guard in this sense. GMC Hummer EV also to a certain amount. And then you've got the Cybertruck and Rivian and Lordstown. And, you know, we've gone through these Smith, you and I, um, it, it, it's an interesting world to live in. Yeah, it is. I mean, we're, we're certainly on, on the cusp of a shift, um, like it or not. And I have no problem with electric power. I know there are a lot of people that do. There are, it's, it's almost like an irrational, Fear, maybe not fear, but a, an, an irrational just refusal to acknowledge that, okay, you can have a vehicle with far less moving parts mm-hmm. that's far easier to maintain, that's far more reliable, that provides far more power, that provides instant power. It's like, what? what's your problem? What are you complaining about? Well, it doesn't make noise. Really? That's, that's your only, that's your only argument. It doesn't make noise. It's like, just, just, just get with the times people. I yeah, think, I, I think, I think electric trucks, especially once, uh, once, you know, the, the battery life becomes a little bit better. Once the charging times are improved. Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in 20 years, I'll say it right now in 20 years, people with electric trucks are going to be like, man, how horrible must did how horrible must it have been to have to like stop at a gas station constantly. And you have that noise just in your ears constantly and you, and you don't have the reliable power band. Yeah. It's I'll say it right now. Go ahead and send in your hate emails to me, podcast at motor one.com, but I'll say it right now. So uh, just to build on that. So I wrote our story today, the Ford e transit, the pricing and some, some other revised details about that came out today. And Ford saying that the upkeep costs for a commercial client. So, you know, they're probably going to be driving more than a normal person, but for an e transit versus a combustion power transit, it's 40% less. Yeah. So just imagine like 40%. I mean, that's, that's a huge, I, I mean, people need to realize just how big of a change that will be. Right. Cause there's never, Oh, I need to schedule an oil change. You know, you still yeah. got to, you know, rotate the tires, but you know, whatever you still have a braking system, but uh, all of those expenses expenses that go along with an internal combustion engine of just keeping that up spark plugs, you know, coolant, all of that stuff. It kind of, it goes away more or less. So, yeah, yeah. no, it's, it, it's, it's going to be much, much cheaper in the long run to have an electric vehicle than it will be to have a internal combustion. And I love, I love the sound as much as anybody else, but, totally. but when you look at the benefits, you know what, you can buy little devices to plug into a cigarette lighter that will pump engine <laughs> yeah. sounds through your stereo. Or if that, you know, if that doesn't 
work. You, you can just drive down the road. Bah, 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 bah. There you go. Problem solved. What you could do is you could just keep a um, keep like a Harley V rod in the bed of your F one fifty at all times. <laughs> Just have it be idling in the just bed of your F-150 lane. Drive around, just let it idle. Bop, but bop, the bop, V-Rod bop. has a Porsche-designed engine that actually sounds good, unlike other Harleys. <laughs> yeah, you need, to, you need to get like a Sportster or something, some some big V-Twin. that. Uh, and plus, if you have that idling in the bed, it'll those, shake things, around, those things like, shake so yeah. bad, it'll feel like you have a big lumpy cam in your EV F-150. Perfect. Oh, we're, we just, we're breaking new ground right here. We just solved the whole problem. Exactly. Brett did. That's that's Brett's Brett's idea. We got to give credit where credit is. We'll due. put him on the pat. Yeah. Hey, I don't want my of, name anywhere near that pat. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the Brett Evans idle uh, idle device. Yeah. So Rude. just uh, uh, tangent. My dad has been saying this for years, and I actually agree with him. I don't understand why more EV makers like in a take in for per se. Why can't I make it sound like a 917? Like, why can't I make it sound like a flat 12? If it's a pipe through sound, pick your best sounding models ever and just let it let me hear that sound in the cabin. Let us hear that with with their that like in 2012 or something like that, those five electric concepts that Lotus built. Okay, I remember those. And none of them came out, but they, they built these really cool five electric concepts. They had that where you could select your sound. And you could pick anything from like generic vacuum noise, like you get in like a current EV, or um, one of them was like a mix of a Tron light cycle and a Tie Fighter, which is just like <laughs> okay, my favorite yes. thing in the world. Like that's that's what I want everything to sound like in the future. But um, you could you could pick um, classic race cars or like yeah. Let me hear a Lotus sounds. Twin Cam. It was really in cool. my Avija, and sure, it was really really cool. And I'm I'm sad that more automakers haven't like chosen to adopt that because it makes a lot of sense to me too. Yeah. I, actually, I guess it does make a lot of sense. I mean, you know, you'll have the people that'll be like, "Oh, it's fake! It's fake! It's like, Everything's well, it's fake, fake now!" Like, yeah, for a lot of performance cars, it's fake. So, if it's going to be fake anyway, let's make it sound. Let's make it be a good fake. Let, let's yeah. make it cool fake. Yeah, let's make it cool fake. Do and, you guys want to talk about some of the some of the the lightning history that we've been alluding to here for uh, for the last half hour or so? I do. I do. Yeah. I want to hear Just, everything you know about it. Oh boy. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I worked at a at a marketing company in in Michigan right at the tail end of the SVT uh tenure uh, in 2006. And uh, and part of my job was to to man some of the phones for the info center. So yeah, I mean, I, I got acquainted with the Lightnings with the first gen with the second gen Lightnings. Um what a lot of people and I kind of touched on this earlier, what a lot of people don't really understand um unless they really know the lightnings well um svt they they didn't they weren't just trying to put a bigger engine to just give it more power uh to make it go and that's one of the reasons why i'm scratching my head over a new electric lightning um because attention was given to the suspension on these on the original lightning which by the way the first gen ford f-150 svt lightning 1993 we're taking a look at that right now um for those on for those not on YouTube, if you're not on YouTube, go there and check us out. You can see us, uh, you can see us kind of ranting and raving and understanding what we're talking about a little bit better. 93, it came out. Um, it had the 5.8 liter. It was a 351 cubic inch V8. Uh, Ford tweaked the intake. They tweaked it with the GT40 heads, bumped it up to 240 horsepower, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was decent. For the time it was. I, I mean, I mean, at, at the time, um, the 93 Lightning could just about run side by side with Ford's five liter Mustang GT of the day. Um, the Cobras were a little bit quicker, uh, but the, uh, the SVT lightnings that they were what zero to 60 in about seven seconds, which again, doesn't sound very impressive now, but we're talking 25 odd years ago. That was a pretty good number for just about anything. Never mind a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. And um, they were lowered. They were lowered. Um, I'm gonna have to look at my cheat sheet for this one because I don't remember exactly. Um, they were they had a one inch drop in the front and they had a two and a half inch drop in the back, so it actually sat quite a bit lower. The suspension was tuned for better handling, and I mean it still had the solid rear axle in the back, but this was back when everything still had solid rear axles. So 
not a big deal. Mm -hmm. It had the 17 inch wheels with the sticky tires. And I mean, it wasn't necessarily a corner carver, but it, it wasn't bad in the turns either. I mean, and mind you, this is a pickup truck, just two seats inside. Uh, still, you still had a payload, uh, you know, bed in the back for payload. And yeah, it, it kind of, it kind of just became something out of an icon right there in that first generation, 1993 to 1995. Um, they gave it the 410 gears in the back. So it had decent acceleration, top speed. Uh, no, don't even worry about top speed <laughs> in, in, in that generation Ford. That was really more about, about quarter miles, but it was probably more limited by tires too. I don't think you could really get a light truck tire that could do much more than 93 or hundred oh, miles they an hour or something like that. They weren't running light truck tires. They were, they had uh Gosh, I can't remember what they were, but I mean, they, I mean, that's it, a performance tire. It's it. They, they stepped away from the light trucks. Um, oh, but it's a, it's kind of a high profile tire though, isn't it? Like we're, we're well, looking at a picture. Those, the, the, this picture that Those you got, Bruce. Yeah. The, yeah. That's not stock. Um, they were 17 inch wheels. Huh? I think no, they were like, a, I think they were like a 265 or a 275 50 or something. I I not that, that's that's one stat that that escapes me, but I mean it was really I mean it was a legit street truck. Um, it was not it it had no aspirations of going anywhere off road. Mm -hmm. the The joke was, oh, do you ever take your SVT Lightning off road? And it's like, you mean on purpose? Like like, <laughs> I mean sometimes if we miss an apex, maybe we'll go off road. I mean that was that was kind of the joke, right? Especially with the second gens. Um, the first gen lightnings, I mean, they were they were good for what they were, but Ford and SVT really took a, a deeper step on the second gen lightning starting in 1999. Um, those first two years, I mean, this was when SVT, in my opinion, was really just it was like they could do no wrong. Okay, they they were on the cusp of having the 0304 Terminator Cobras. They were horsepower hungry. Um, that second gen Lightning started with 360 horsepower. It had the 5.4 supercharged V8. Um, in 2001, they upped it to 380, and they did a lot more suspension tuning on those trucks. And uh, right, and even to this day, when you look at the 99 to 04 uh, Lightnings, especially the 03 and the 04 Lightnings, I mean their values are still up there. Mm -hmm. They they. People that have them, they don't want to get rid of them. They've absolutely attained a well. It's I think it's beyond a cult status, a cult following. Um, the performance that those trucks had from the factory. You're talking a mid 14 second quarter mile, zero to sixteen about five seconds, provided you could get it to hook up because 380 horsepower with just the empty bed in the back. They, they had trouble hooking up. Uh, but if you put some slicks on them, I mean, I, I remember seeing people breaking into 13s with stock trucks, wow. just just with the just with a good set of drag radios on the back going to the track. And this was a truck that still hauled it could still tow 5000 pounds. And uh, with his suspension tuning. And I mean, I remember seeing some people tracking these trucks that, OK, you know, it, it's it's a truck. It was still like 40, 4600 pounds, I think. But what is a new GT 500 way? More than <laughs> right? that. Right, I mean, I, mean, I, I think at the, no, it's more than that. The the, the what what's more the a GT five hundred is at, at least that or more. Um, because I was looking at the numbers for a story recently. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I mean, a new GT five hundred is pretty much right there. Yeah, um, it is, totally. and I mean, just the the stance, the stance of the second gen lightnings, the combination of the power. It's, I mean, that's. It, Ford has it, a lot to Ford has a lot to live up to if if they do bring back that lightning moniker, even though it's not going to be SVT. Well, we think I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they could do some sort of SVT thing internally. I don't know. Um, but there's there's a lot of history that goes along with that moniker that whether Ford wants it or not. Yeah, they're going to get a lot of attention if they do call it the lightning. And you know what? I, I hope it can live up. So just to clarify, I'm looking at our GT500 review now. Um, we quoted it at as uh, 4,171 pounds for G for the modern. Okay, so it's, 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 it's it's a little less. It's a it's little, a little less. less. Yeah, I was wrong, but but we're still it, talking about a body on frame pickup truck. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and yeah. the other um, thing is, to me, what we're looking at now, 
the second gen lightning to me is the lightning. I, I, I don't know if it's certainly out of my wheelhouse. I was also a younger person at the time. I don't remember ever seeing a first gen lightning in my area. I lived in Northeastern Ohio. They just, they either didn't exist or they blended in to such an extent that I never noticed them. Whereas the second gen to me, that I look at that like, Oh, that, okay. I, I immediately recognize that as a lightning. You know, I don't have production numbers right in front of me, but um, I mean, there you can look them up online really easy. Um, SVT never built their vehicles in the same kind of volume um, as you would expect from from other automakers. The idea mm -hmm. was these are going to be niche halo vehicles. They're going to be special vehicles that not everybody can own. Um, and, and they really kind of kept the production in check. And, and those, those first, the first generation, the 93, 94, 95, I won't say they were a surprise, but I mean, we've, we've gotten so used to, seed automakers in the development phase and listening to automakers talking about vehicles sometimes years before they're released um back then it was just kind of like oh by the way here check this out yeah you know we lowered a we lowered an f-150 and you know we have the bigger engine in it with a little bit more power um i mean it wasn't an afterthought but it was more of a okay we have this we have this new performance team you know let's let's dip our toes into some into some water we'll see what we can do here and then the second generation lightning in 99 is where you really start to see okay we're going to put a lot more thought into this one and, and we're going to take it to the next level and i mean that was the fastest that was the fastest pickup truck in the world um for well i, I forget for exactly how long it was uh, like the 04 04 or 05 ram srt was the one that finally finally yeah, the, broke the, the ram srt finally got up there um, but yeah, and, and that was a cool truck too, but I mean, with the big, with the big wheels, yeah, it just, it, it's, it, hard, it's hard to argue with the significance that the SVT lightning had on the, had on the market for at least a decade or so, you know, that, that first generation, it wasn't the first sporty factory pickup truck. There was the Silverado SS and then the, uh, Dodge Little Red Express before that, but, oh, but it definitely, Express. Is a good truck, but it definitely was like kind of the first really hardcore, holistic, concerted like build that an automaker really had in the in the segment. It really kind of influenced. I don't think the SRT10 would have existed without it. I don't think the Tacoma X Runner would have existed without it. It really kind of was was a very a very standard bearing vehicle for a long mm -hmm. time. And and I mean Ford was ready to do the SVT Lightning for the. Uh for the next generation in 2005. And I mean, they had, they had prototypes up. They were, they were looking at making it happen. Um, and that was when, you know, pretty much everything changed at SVT Ford decided to mainstream the group because up to that point, I mean, it, it was still a, a Ford property, but I mean, SVT, um, you know, as we talked a few weeks ago, Bruce with, uh, with John Clore, SVT had its own kind of building, its own people, um, it didn't have to answer or, or go through some of the other chains that some of the, the other groups did. And they had a lot of autonomy. And then Ford decided to mainstream that, pull that back in. Um, and that's when a lot of things just kind of went away. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, and, uh, it kind of seems like the same thing is happening with SVT and Stellantis now that, you know. SRT. Oh, SRT. I'm SRT. sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, SRT, SVT, SVE, SVO. <laughs> I had, yeah, two out of three letters, right? Come on, give me credit here. <laughs> um, but it, the same thing is happening with Stellantis now is that the stories we're seeing is that those engineers that were in that SRT team is that they are kind of going out into other sections of the company. And so that those vehicles aren't going to happen quite the same way. And it, that's a bummer, you know? Yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, I look at it this way. I was I was a huge huge proponent of SVT and was very sad to see it go away. But I mean these days we have just some epic performance vehicles not just from Ford but I mean I mean from uh from GM I mean the C8 Corvette is a, is I think is a maze balls. Mm -hmm. I I love the Camaro. I'm sad to see that apparently a lot of people don't want to buy one. It's kind of dying on the vibe. Um um and as much as I rail on 
on uh, Stellantis and Dodge and Jeep for just wanting to SRT all the things or Hellcat all the things. I mean, come on. It's you can't be a car nerd. You can't be a performance nerd and not smile over a 703 horsepower pickup truck, you mm-hmm. know, so, you know, credit where credit is due. Um, but hey, times change. The one thing that doesn't change is people want power. So even though some of these groups will go away, something else will come in to fill the void. And uh, well, and especially when you think about when SVT really kind of was in its prime, it still was only making two vehicles, the Cobra and the Lightning. And now if you look at the Ford Performance Stable, you've got three different, two, di- two different variants of the Mustang, one variant of the F-150. And then up until a couple of years ago, you had a performance version of the Focus and the Fiesta as well. And now you've got the Edge and the Explorer ST. So, you know, taking point. these performance, these little performance centers and kind of diversifying them across your lineup, it, it maybe doesn't yield that same, like, really wonderful purity that made the lightning and the Cobra special, but it still gives the entire lineup something to, to smile about. And I think you'll probably see that now that SRT is kind of backfilling into, into the rest of Stellantis. You're probably going to see more interesting versions of all of their vehicles instead of just, you know, the, the four Dodge products and uh, the Ram and the Cherokee, Grand Cherokee. I don't know. I, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I kind of, it is a bummer. It's a shame to see see these like really beautiful, pure skunk works go away. But I think it kind of yields a better product overall in the end. I'm looking forward to the future and to uh, and to prevent the uh, the people that are no doubt already typing. Hey, there were more than two vehicles at SVT. I'll I'll, I'll do the shout out. Yes, you had you had well the, technically yeah the Ford GT was an SVT product but you also had the SVT Contour, oh, and the Contour from yeah, 96 or, or not nice from 98 to 2000 and then you had the SVT Focus that kind of took the place for the Contour Brett mentioned so, the Focus so, so I mentioned three, it so, as so part of Ford performance it was my bad they so, they had so three vehicles no they, no hate mail required there folks you're right you're right you're right you're right not just two you're right and the only reason I say that is because I had a I had a club for shows and SVT contours and yeah I, I, I wanted so, a contour really I was bad so deep too. Into those cars. I feel bad for forgetting it. I wanted one so bad when I was sixteen. Well, look around because you can still. I mean, you can find an SVT contour for like fifteen hundred bucks. Pull the two five. Really that cheap? <sighs> yeah, they just so many of them just got just beat up so bad yeah. it's hard to find one that hasn't either been beaten or modified so just find just find a cheap one that maybe needs some engine work because it's got the it's got the two five uh that was really only used in the contour yank that engine out do a three liter duratec swap you get the same <laughs> horsepower as the svt contour with a little more torque connect it up with the manual transmission go out and have fun okay sounds like a plan <laughs> fair enough well, for anyone listening, if you have anything you want to send us, any comments, we are still waiting for someone to send us their their project car. Well, like, we've had I, we've had a couple, but it's been a while since we've had anything new. I, it's I mean, been we, a long while. I, We're I mean, on we, episode eighteen, and it's been months, friend. So yeah, tell us what you have going on with your project cars. We are, we definitely, definitely are going to devote an entire episode to project cars once to, you send us enough to, yeah to the vehicles, i want to the to. vehicles <laughs> that you're working on to the vehicles that you're excited about so yeah send us on send them on into us podcast at motor one.com you know the address by now yeah um, <sighs> the other thing is a correction from last week and this yep. was from a youtube commenter um i said that the Civic arrived in the U.S. I either said 76 or 78. I didn't go back to listen to the episode because, you know, sometimes when you're talking, things happen. The commenter said it was 73, and he was absolutely right. It is 1973. Yes. In fact, if you search 1973 Honda Civic review, um, Car and Driver has actually republished their review of the 73 Civic. So for anyone who wants to read that, and I'm actually probably going to read this later on just because it's you know it's interesting it's i wonder how it stacked up at the time um it's still available so 
that was my mistake. Admittedly, I was born in 85. So well after the Shame Civic. Shame on you. Yeah. I, like I, I was guessing. I thought I didn't know it, what was it was later either. in the 70s than it was. Um, and actually before this show, we were talking that we thought that when the Civic debuted, it was the SVCC, which was Honda's name for kind of its very clean engine burning process. And eventually that became Civic. But from kind of looking around, that doesn't necessarily appear to be the case, that it was the Civic, but it had the SVCC engine. So, again, my screw up, I, I totally admit to it. 73 was the first year of the Civic. So thank you, commenter. And I probably said something wrong or I'm going to say something <laughs> wrong later in this episode. So Are you go ahead and we- tell me. We ramble like crazy. We constantly say things wrong. That's part yeah, of the that's economy. rambling on cars. You say certain things. Granted, 73 to if I said 76 or 78, I was within three to five years. Close. Give me a bit of credit. Like, Close. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't. Mean, right. I didn't I say mean, we 87. Are, <laughs> we are saddled with the terrible responsibility of knowing everything about all cars ever that's created. Right. Um, that's that's. One of the crosses that automotive journalists have to bear, <laughs> but especially hey. when talking on a podcast and not <laughs> being able to look it up for a story. <laughs> we're we're right. such a persecuted group of people, aren't we? Oh, my That's goodness. Right. Yeah, we are. We're, we're terrible. Yeah. I mean, I can hear people hashing on the keyboards right now. OMG, I cannot believe you don't know the tire size of the SVT Lightning. <laughs> Enter. <laughs> So, so I'll yeah. I'll field those emails when they come in. Podcast at motor one.com. Let's talk some let's talk about some more trucks. Yeah, that, we talked that, about that don't what, have blue oval badges. Ex- well, maybe well, I don't well, think any of some, them do. some of maybe them, some of them might some of them do. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about what might be the new lightning. We talked about what was the old lightning, but Brett uh, almost a year ago to the date, I, I've got this uh, the story up here, April 29th. So we're basically a year old, you wrote a story for us about pickup truck concepts. Um, And it's a cool story. And unfortunately, you never really got to kind of talk about it after you wrote it. So we're going to talk pickup concepts. Um, Some of the ones are the ones that you covered the story. We kind of found some other ones that were interesting as well. But let's talk weird truck concepts. How's that sound? Let's do it. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, so we don't usually see a whole lot of, um, drastic changes in the truck market for the most part, you know, like each, each new generation of a truck is a little bit better than the one that preceded it. Right. That's um, the way it goes. But we don't usually see these like big, huge, splashy debuts until recently, at least, you know, like the Cybertruck was huge. And then the Rivian and the, um, mm-hmm. the, um, other vehicle, like the TRX and some of these vehicles have really kind of been like higher watermarks, but those are relatively recent. So these are just kind of some cool random trucks that I remember seeing in, you know, my my issues of motor trend and truck trend and car and driver and automobile growing up. And I kind of was like, oh, let's just why don't we talk about them for a few minutes and just see what people remember. And um, some some great comments on the story, people chiming in with their own stuff. Um, this is the first one that I listed, the AMC Cowboy, which was kind of a wacky El Camino version of the AMC Hornet. Um and, and I never uh, knew that even existed. Yeah, and that was one. I, I that thought was I thought I was always time. pretty good on some of these. And this took some digging because I didn't. I didn't either. I it wasn't one of the ones that I thought of. I thought of like the Ram Charger or the T Rex or whatever. But um, I actually reached out to FCA and was like, "Hey, what what cool things has Jeep done?" And this was one of the things that they came back with the AMC Jeep Cowboy, which is just. Uh, I'm kind of bummed it didn't come around. I would like to would like to tool around in one of those kind of like that coop, coop utility gentleman farmer kind of thing which looks pretty sweet <laughs> just um, imagine the just imagine the cool press photos we could have had with this bruce yeah no totally. <laughs> so no and we're not going to go through them all and there's some other ones yeah. you know yeah there's some really this good is, ones. so the one we're looking at now is the chevrolet xt2 concept from 89 which, look at that which is freaking gorgeous like t- totally I- i'm not lying here Elon Musk could come out with this right now and put a Tesla badge on it and it would sell like gangbusters yeah. and tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, but but the the 
Tesla fanboys, you could put a Tesla badge. Yeah, that's, not a fair, that's not a fair litmus test of any vehicle. I, I, on, a, on a 40-year-old refrigerator. I hate you like, guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> But no, Bruce, I agree. This thing, this thing looks fantastic. It's gorgeous. It's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. I mean, um, can I, so it's a very swoopy shape. It's, you know, it's not kind of, we kind of think of that eighties vehicle that kind of, um, Gigero, very, um, kind of sharp linear, lines yeah. that DeLorean or Sirocco or things like that. This is not that this is very smooth. This is it. It's really a pretty vehicle. And I understand like no one would buy this. Like it's not really a functional vehicle, but it's gorgeous. I mean, it could be as long as I can reach over that that rear gate and put stuff in the back. Well, yeah, there's no tailgate there, but for a production version, you add a tailgate and you're done basically. And you add some tail lights, which this doesn't have. But Brett, I love what you said in this article. Um, the XT2 looks like the consequence of a one night stand between an F body Camaro and an El Camino. He's and, not wrong. And you're not wrong at all. Um, I mean, I it's, mean I think, it's a low slung, it's a low slung car based truck. But, I don't know when the F body design study was revealed. I think this might have predated it a little bit. So this really might've been the, kind of the original sketch for the F body Camaro, the, you know, that final generation Camaro that came out in 94, um, 93, 93. Not 93. Um, yeah. yeah. This could be, this could be one of the earliest design studies for that vehicle. And then it kind of, you know, they're like, okay, well, what if we take this and actually turn it into a proper two door coupe? That could have been. Yeah. I, the, I do. I do see, I do see some of that in the, uh, in the front clip. I see a little bit of that maybe in that, uh, in that, B pillar and the in the roof kind of there just a little bit. I mean, obviously the Camaro doesn't have a big honking bed behind it, but yeah, that thing. Oh. So Brett, oh. uh, we got to go back in time a little bit, and this is a vehicle <laughs> that, uh, again, for our non YouTube audience, it actually existed. This is a BMW M3 pickup truck. And it existed. This was a, a, the story that was told. This was the shop vehicle for the BMW M team. So whenever they needed to haul bits and pieces around the shop, this is what they used. And you can see that it's kind of a E30 Cabrio that has had the rear seats and trunk removed. It's got, you know, it's got kind of diamond. diamond so much plate. diamond plate. Oh yeah. Steel. All the diamond plate. Yeah. In the back for hauling parts. But this was legitimately, this was a one-off. This vehicle existed. It was never going to be a production vehicle, but this is what hauled around parts at, uh, for BMW M. And as a BMW fan, Brett, and also for me, I love this stupid thing. That it was never really going to see production, but thank God it, someone built it it kind of makes you it kind of makes you wonder how difficult so i think they used i might be completely off on this but it looks like it's got the roll bar from like a bauer tc um maybe. series maybe um but it makes me wonder how difficult it would be to reproduce like if you if you had yourself a rusty e30 cabrio that you just weren't going to do anything with i kind of wonder how difficult it would be to reproduce this it's like it's finished well but it doesn't certainly doesn't look factory finished i feel like if you oh, were God, relatively... no. you can see like the panel lines like yeah. ginormous like this I... was not ever going to be a production vehicle this is just literally this is a shop truck that a bunch of german engineers decided to hack together and they did a damn good job of it i mean i just would love to see like a le mans team a le mans team pull up with like a, a rusty e3318 i towed by a rusty M3 Cabrio pickup truck E30 monstrosity. Like I think that would be so cool, and I don't think it would be that difficult. I mean, if you if you were relatively skilled. Here, I've got another angle of it here. Just one second. Yeah, it it, it probably wouldn't be. Um, I mean, especially you're already starting with a Cabrio. You, you don't have you don't have a big roof that you have to remove, yeah. right? Yeah, there you go. So it's just going to be going in, getting the rear seat. I mean, you out. can see the soft top on the roof, like yeah, well, and things cut out. And I, they didn't, it doesn't even look like they bothered to, um, you know, in building the M3 pickup truck, it doesn't even look like they gave it the M3 front and rear fenders. It still has the traditional E30 yeah. fenders. So yeah. I just, I can't believe that it'd be very difficult to recreate this. And it has me thinking that 
if I ever decide I need to send in a project car to y'all, it might be one of these. <laughs> and again, there's not even a tailgate. Like they literally just cut off. You can see where the trunk is supposed to be. Like, yeah, it's a simple build. It's clearly just like a shop build, but it's Good cool that it's from the BMW M team. Good and for them. So before we look at more concepts, just because I have the links up here, here is the successor to that vehicle that apparently once you know, that vehicle kind of served its time. They built another one out of an E90. <laughs> so we know that there's almost certainly a V8 under the hood, but yeah, they just decided, okay, the E30 served its time. Here's the new one. And again, it looks like they made it out of a cabrio. You can see the front section of the hardtop convertible mm -hmm. roof, you know, right there. <sighs> I just, I'm so happy that they did this. It's so great. <laughs> yeah. And we'll post uh, a link to the story. This also includes some of the other uh, uh, BMW M projects that didn't happen, like the M Compact, which is just so cool, where they took an E36 engine and shoved it into what Americans would call a 318 Ti. I think Europe got the 323 Ti. Am I wrong about that, Brett? Didn't they get the inline six on that? And we only yeah, got they four got a cylinder. Larger. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. But still, they put the, the six into that and it, it's just... They, did, they had some cool skunk works for sure. You know, they, they had a uh, really... Like one of two, maybe M. Uh, we should get a story up about this. The M, the E thirty four M five convertible, um, and then you I think know, we I think that might be in the story. I could you be should, wrong. Oh, wrong, wrong. Photo. We should Hold on. we should talk about that for sure. That was a pretty cool machine. We'll talk about that another time. But that was a pretty cool machine. In the story that you're talking about, I know we had a we have an E forty six M three station wagon. Yep. Um, just some really cool cool stuff that this this random skunk works has done and and uh yeah it's cool to see cool to see engineers letting their hair down a little bit and having some fun when when the overlords give them the opportunity <laughs> well it's so not even the, so much the opportunity it's that they had this was the m team they had the car sitting there sure. they had the engine sitting there and they said let's just take a couple afternoons and fit one into the other and <laughs> it happened here I love it. while we're sitting here talking here, I'm going to pull up these photos. You guys vamp just for a second for me. Is so it can... a, is it interesting to anybody else that we're talking about concept trucks and we actually haven't looked at a traditional truck yet? I mean, really? I know we're, I know we're at unibody, unibody, I, I know we're car based trucks. Yeah, I mean, I know these are these are technically trucks and and their concepts, but I, I mean, yeah, these are all unibody car based vehicles. Um, something that might possibly have some sort of resurgence coming soon with vehicles like the Maverick and the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which are unibody vehicles. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe there is something to this market after all, maybe there is demand for something smaller um, that's more car based as opposed to the, uh, the big trucks that we have thus far. Okay, Smith, that's enough. Brett and I are going to nerd yep. out about BMWs. Yep. Go now. ahead. You, you guys go ahead and go for it. <laughs> so here is that, uh, the the uh, sorry, the 318 Ti, Ti in general that they made. So we're looking at the outside. It looks completely normal. Um, here will be an engine shot of it right now. So you'll see the engine. Sorry. So big inline six, and then the absolute coolest part to me are these old school uh, carbon fiber seats right there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very cool. Very elemental. You can you can see the, the, <laughs> the uh, Extremely holster elemental. is literally stretched over the back. That's insane. Yeah. Yep. So... My first BMW experience, I think, was uh, was with a 318, actually. Yeah. Way, way back um, um, was my, like, third year of college. I was working at a BMW dealership, just doing just detail work. And, um, well, it was a Lincoln, Mercury, Suzuki, Mitsubishi, and BMW dealership. Okay. A bizarre group so of vehicles. <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't that. And, uh, yeah, the 318, uh I don't know. It never did much for me, to be honest. It but doesn't did, do much for anyone. But right. but I did learn to drive on a uh, on a on a brand new three twenty eight, or I did learn to drive a manual transmission on a brand new three twenty eight because they were like, 
I, I mean, you know, just a college kid. You know how to drive a stick, right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure, I do. I've, I've seen this happen before. I know what to do. So it kind of spoils you because, I mean, it's such a good manual, right, in those cars. Mm -hmm. And then you go to, you know, a plebeian manual, and it's just like, ugh. So that's my BMW story. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about trucks again. It's truck trucks. time again. Jump so, back to it. Everyone talks about the Ram TRX today. So I don't think you get to the Ram TRX without talking about the T-Rex. Wait, which T-Rex? Oh, this is a different T-Rex. That's a T-Rex. There was a T-Rex before the T-Rex, and this was actually called T-Rex. Yeah. What was the T-Rex before the T-Rex? Oh, gosh. What, what, what we're looking at right now. I think you're saying there's one more before this, and I was going to be oh. shook. No, no, no. Sorry. Sorry. Not to confuse everybody. No, this is this is a six by six uh, Dodge Ram monster. Yeah, this has the uh, I think it has the they built this to publicize the V10. So kind of in the same way that that um, the SRT 10 publicized the V10 for the second generation. This was their like, no, no, no. This is this is a new engine for us. And people always synonymize it with the Viper, but really that eight liter V10 was built as a truck engine first and then just kind of later, you know, evolved into sports car duty. So this is a pretty, pretty bitchin' machine. I, I, uh, I would love to drive something like this. It looks so cool. I mean, I imagine, I don't remember this back in the day, um, but just with the shock value of six by six vehicles now and thinking about how many we've actually seen to see this back then, because I mean, this is way before Mercedes did anything with their, uh, you know, with, with their G right. Mm -hmm. So um, do we know, do, do we remember when this was, I mean, that's, that, that's gotta be mid nineties. I think it was for, I, I think it was a SEMA build. I think it was like SEMA 1990. I'm not even going to try it. 94, 95. I think it was a SEMA build though. I don't even think it was like a mainstream debut. Oh. I am looking at your uh, thing right now. It is 1996, but 96. your your slide here does not say. So it could have been 95, 496, or it could have debuted in 96. Let me just see if I can figure it out. Yeah. So I mean that that wasn't long after that that particular Ram body style came out, no. and I do remember when that came out, and that everybody was huge. Everybody was talking about how good that truck looked, and you know what? It still looks good today. Yeah, it does. I mean, that looks so good. I actually bought one of those a little while ago, and then I just I couldn't stand how it how it rode, so I had to get rid of it. We're gonna but get some I, hate it mail. It was good. it was the '97 SEMA show when it debuted. So '97. Oh. I'm gonna have to go back and change my change my slide text because it is '97. Can, can hear the uh, the haters now. How can you not know when the Ram T Rex was done? So oh, I gotta you? share one that. <laughs> It it affect it didn't affect me, but like I always thought this thing was so cool, and it, it's another vehicle that was never going to happen. But I loved it, and so that was the job, the job, the Jeep <laughs> FC uh, concept. Mm -hmm. um, that thing there, looks like it wants to roll over just sitting still. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. <laughs> but by God, it's cool. And so this is from 2012. It's cool. Oh, it's very uh, cool. And. I just thought this was such a neat idea for Jeep to do, especially in 2012. Like, obviously, there was no way this thing was ever going to get built. But, you know, it kind you can see in the cab that little bit of Wrangler. You can see the tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Wrangler that's left. And everything else was original. And, yeah. Um, I think it was – this is another one that I think if you got really creative, you could maybe make happen because I'm pretty sure the frame and the engine were, like, all but carried over from, like, the Wrangler Unlimited. So if you really wanted to get creative, you might be able to make something like this happen. With uh, I said really creative is the key there. I don't yeah. know, man. <laughs> These these were really cool, and I, I I don't really know why there aren't more forward control trucks out there because um, I mean crash regulations and stuff I'm sure make it difficult, but I I was just driving a um, a U-Haul rent a van a few days ago, and mm -hmm. I had nine feet of cargo room to play with on a footprint that was shorter than even a short bread, a modern short bed pickup truck, and it makes me wonder why they don't do more forward control pickup trucks because you can get literally nine feet a nine foot long bed in you know something that's less than 20 feet long which is which is kind of insane when you really think about it i i 
I kind of agree. I think the Mighty FC would have been a really cool vehicle for them to build if they could have made it happen. So here's one from 2014 that, so I'm a mini guy, so I'm going to post this again, <laughs> a vehicle that was never going to happen, but I just thought it was cool. So this is the Paceman Adventure concept. Um, you can see it's basically just a hacked up mini Paceman, which I, I've seen them on the road. The, so for anyone not familiar, the Paceman was the essentially the two door version of the Clubman. Um, Countryman. Countryman, yes, sorry, countryman. Um, no, now Bruce is getting the hate mail too. We got all with with everyone can get now. hate mail. We all deserve hate mail. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, here's another angle on it. Um, I just vaguely remember these and thinking that they were pretty cool at the time. Oh, same photo. Hold on. I think I think we've established that there's legit interest in smaller trucks yeah. i mean the 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 dodge ram t-rex notwithstanding um i mean we we all have a liking to these smaller vehicles with some cargo capability um trucks don't have to be big tremendous humongous vehicles and i really think there's an underserved market here and i'm excited to see where where we're going here in the future yeah, I, I kind of want to know where the limit is for, you know, for what people really desire out of their small trucks, because um, the Hyundai Santa Cruz in a lot of ways seems like a pretty respectable option for a lot of people who like to go camping or or mountain biking or something like that on the weekend, but don't need something even as large as a Chevy Colorado, you know. Um, I think that might just be right on the bleeding edge of what might be too small, because it, I think the bed is, is less than five feet long, might be closer to four feet. And at that point, you know, like, an SUV has folding rear seats, so you know why not why not go with something like that? But but it still is pretty interesting to see automakers really kind of trying out the truck formula in a in a smaller smaller package. And so I'm I can tell that Brett that listened to our stuff. last episode because I made the same point <laughs> about being able to put a bike in my Outback but hanging the wheel over the Santa Cruz. But I agree with you that I love the fact that um, segment is happening between the Santa Cruz and the Maverick. So yeah. go ahead, Smith. Yeah. Well, no, no, that, that I already set up what I was going to say there. Um, I was what I was also going to say was after talking about, hey, all of these smaller trucks and look at this, I wanted to share probably one of the biggest trucks that uh, that Brett, you had on your list. Um, once we get it up here, the mighty F-350. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. No, wait. That's not it. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. There we go. The oh, big there old we go. Ford, the big old Ford Super Chief. Um, and I wanted to talk about this one because I actually had a personal experience with this uh, okay. when I was doing when I was doing some marketing uh, and PR um, with Ford. Um, I was with Crash Parts Division at the time, and we had a booth out at Las Vegas. Um, once upon a time, there was a collision show that would go on in Vegas the same time as SEMA. And we actually had the Super Chief concept in our booth. And I was amazed. I mean, the thing was like 25 feet long. I mean, it's just, it's just absurdly huge. But when you look at it now, I mean, that truck did preview a lot of the design cues that we would eventually come to see on the F series. Mm -hmm. um, and people during, during the course of that show, people would come up to us and they would be like, well, why isn't Ford building this? Ford needs to build this. And my only, my only response to them was, come back when the show's over and watch them try to drive this thing out of here. <laughs> it had the turning radius. I mean, it's a concept. I mean, it's not supposed to be ready, but I mean, it had the turning radius of like a football field and so many, it just kind of glosses over so many people that when you have a big vehicle like this big, huge wheelbase, yeah, it seems awesome. But do you want to drive it every day? Do you want to live with that every day? I promise you, you don't. So yeah, my little uh, my little Ford pickup story. That being said, I would love to live with a smaller truck. I don't know about the rest of you, the rest of you people out there, but I think living with a small truck would be a pretty cool thing. Definitely. I don't have any fight there, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of everything. Uh, Brett, do you have anything you want to promote? Anything you got coming up? Anything you've written that you want to promote? Anything like that? 
Uh, put me on the spot here. Uh, I know we're, we got some real cool stuff on on Smith's favorite subject, the Mach E coming up. Um, okay. Got a cool video coming out in a couple of weeks, kind of talking about where it falls in the pony car family lineage. Oh, and okay. um, I'm not working on that one. That's uh, that's um, managing editor Brandon Turkis who's doing that fine work. So definitely keep an eye peeled for that one. Cool. All right. Well, as always, uh, no, depending on when you're listening, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. We always appreciate you for appreciate that you listen to this show and that you give us your time. Um, podcast at motorone.com is the email address. You can find us at Motor One on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I, and also you can always find the post on the website. So every yeah. Friday. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts, you can find us. And if there happens to be somewhere you listen to podcasts that you can't find us, let us know and we'll try to get there. But we're we'll try pretty, to plug it in. We're out there. Um, but yeah, in more ways than one. In more <laughs> ways than one. Thank you, Brett, for jumping in there. You said it. You beat me by like a half a second, man. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye bye.